Introducing Falling Through the Archives, a Watershed Z production. You can't, you cannot. Oh, I'm awfully sorry. I say I'm awfully sorry. Well, say Friday. Good Friday, dear. You won't have anything on Friday. Oh, I'll see you Friday night. Thank you very much. I'm much obliged. Come on, my boy. <laughs> A hundred years ago, there was a man named John. Or was it 80 years ago? Or was it today? Even John's not sure. All he really knows is that while so many things change, there are also so many things that stay the same. Traveling through the web of time with his old friend Ed in their ever-changing barbershop, John makes a point to always grab the local newspaper. The time capsules that let him and Ed know exactly where, and more importantly, when they are. No matter what part of time they land in, it seems John and Ed are known by every local they encounter, so it's best they stay up on the times. Today we find John returning to the shop with a copy of the Alexandria Gazette. The date is June 29th, 1914, and they're in a place called Alexandria, Virginia. Yesterday, June 28th, 1914, Franz Ferdinand, Archduke of Austria, and his wife Sophie were assassinated by Bosnian Serbian assassin Gravillo Princip, a member of the Serbian Black Hand in Sarajevo. And an already heated history is about to become searing hot. You might wonder who the Black Hand was and why did they exist? Well, while it's been brewing for decades, in 1908, the Habsburgs took possession of the Serbian territories Bosnia and Herzegovina and then tried to convince the Serbians to look to the successes of the other recent unification movements in Germany and Italy. But they weren't buying it. They felt like slaves to the autocracy. So, in 1911, a group of free Serbs created the Serbian resistance movement called the Black Hand. What they wanted was not only to free the Serbs under Habsburg rule, but to unify all Serbs under one kingdom. And they would do whatever was necessary to create a free, unified Serbia. Thus, when the Black Hand leadership found out that the Austria-Hungary's Archduke and heir to the throne, Franz Ferdinand would be making an official visit to attend military exercises in Sarajevo, the official plotting began. And now we too are falling through the archives. Well, Ed, looks like we're still in Alexandria, and it's still 1914. Not a big shock, John. All I had to do was look out the window to know that. Go on. What's happening in the world today? Same old humdrum, or today something special? Give me a minute, would you? Let me get myself situated. Yeah? Go on, in. All righty, let's see here. Oh, boy, Ed. Today is Monday, June 29th, 1914. Oh, yeah? Well, I guess yesterday was the uh, something special day this time. Yes, sir. I believe you're right about that. And there it is. Archduke and Duchess killed. Shot to death while in an automobile in capital of Bohemia. Sorrow throughout Europe at dual horror. Emperor Francis Joseph about to suffer collapse. Vienna, June 29th. While the flags at half-mast float from public and many homes here, reports reach Vienna that scores of arrests are being made today in Sarajevo and that virtual martial law prevails as an aftermath of an assassination yesterday of the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary and his wife. Mixed with the feeling of anger and sorrow which sweeps the empire today is solitude for the aged Emperor Franz Joseph, the emperor careworn and feeble, a great sorrow adding to the weight of his years, arrived here at 11 o'clock this morning. The populace massed at the station gave him a wonderful greeting, tinged as it was with sympathy. Ministers Birchtold and Tiza met the venerable monarch, and immediately upon his arrival at the palace, he called a ministerial conference. The greatest anxiety is felt that the emperor may not survive this latest tragedy in his life. The heat is terrific and debilitating to one of the emperor's age. Sarajevo, Bosnia, June 29th. Archduke Francis Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, and the Duchess of Hohenberg, his Morganic wife, were shot dead yesterday by a student in the main street of the Bosnian capital a short time after they had escaped death from a bomb hurled at the Royal Automobile. 
They were slain while passing through the city on their annual visit to the annexed province of Bosnia and Herzegovina. The first attempt against the Archduke occurred just outside of the girls' high school. His car had restarted after a brief pause for an inspection of the building when Gabrinovics hurled a bomb. This was so successfully warded off by the Archduke that it fell fiercely beneath the following car, occupants of which Count von Booz Waldeck and Colonel Mirizio were struck by slivers of iron. Archduke Francis Ferdinand stopped his car and after making inquiries and lending what aid he could, continued his journey to the town hall. There, the Burgomaster began the customary address, but Archduke sharply interrupted and snapped out, Here, Burgomaster, we have come to pay you a visit, and bombs have been thrown at us. This is an amazing indignity. After a pause, the Archduke said, Now you may speak. On leaving the hall, the Archduke and his wife announced their intention of visiting the wounded members of their suite at the hospital on the way back to the palace. They were actually bound on their mission of mercy when, at the corner of Rudolfstrasse and Franz Josefstrasse, Princip opened fire. A bullet struck the Archduke in the face. The Duchess was wounded in the abdomen, and another bullet struck her in the throat, severing an artery. She fell unconscious across her husband's knee. At the same moment, the Archduke sank to the floor of the car. The assassins were interrogated by the police, and both seemed to glory in their exploit. Princip said he had studied for a time at Belgrade. He declared he had long intended to kill some imminent person from nationalist motives. He was awaiting the Archduke at the point where he knew the automobile would slacken speed, turning onto Franz Josef Strasse. The presence of the Duchess in the car caused him to hesitate, but only for a moment. Then his nerve returned, and he emptied his pistol at the Imperial pair. He denied that he had any accomplices. Princip is 18 years of age. Gabrinovic is 21. He told the police that he had obtained the bomb from an anarchist in Belgrade, whose name he did not know. He denied also that he had accomplices and treated the tragedy with cynical indifference. After his unsuccessful attempt to blow up the Imperial visitors, Gabrinovic sprang into the river in an effort to escape, but witnesses of his crime plunged after him and seized him. A few yards from the scene of the shooting, an unexploded bomb was found, which it is suspected was thrown away by an accomplice after he had noted the success of Princip's attack. Midland butter, 35 cents a pound. For years recognized as the best, it comes to Alexandria. Edward Quinn and Sons. Yeah, yeah, get ready, go to Marshall Hall, Tuesday, June 30th. Special features, a baseball game. $10 in gold given to one holding lucky ticket. Free ice to all. The children from Alexandria's children's home will be entertained free. Come along. Everybody will have a good time. Boats leave at 10.30 a.m., 2.30 p.m., and 7 p.m. Yeah, yeah, get ready, go. Tickets for adults, 25 cents. Well, if that if they think that's the end of it, they got one heck of a surprise headed their way. Well, look here. This is horrible. Two young girls lose their lives. Loretta Kelly and Helen Leona Downey drown at Dyke. Get into deep water. Paul cast over Alexandrians at resort. Bodies brought to the city in storm last night. Early yesterday afternoon, a pall was cast over many Alexandrians who are passing the day at the Dyke by the drowning of two 13-year-old girls of the city. They had been bathing, and while so engaged, suddenly found themselves in deep water. They seized each other and disappeared in what is locally known as the suck hole, (coughs) at that place and drowned in each other's arms. The victims of this sad accident were Helen Leona Downey, daughter of Miss Ellen M. and late John T. Downey of 721 Gibbon Street, and Mary Loretta Kelly, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Thomas F. Kelly of 327 South Alfred Street. Versions of the incident vary in some minor particulars. Some say the girls, while in the water, caught hold of a rowboat which was passing them and allowed themselves to be towed out from the shore. The man in charge of the rowboat warned them of their danger, as they were likely to be taken into deep water. Neither could swim, and they were prevailed upon to release their hold 
upon the boat and returned to the more shallow waters. They, however, in their gambles, gradually moved away from the shore and eventually found their feet sliding downward. To their horror, they realized that they were being forced by a strong outward current into the dreaded suckle. They seized each other simultaneously and sank to rise no more. John Risens, who was at the bridge near the spot where the girls disappeared, jumped into the water in hopes of rescuing them. But as they failed to reappear upon the surface, he found himself powerless to render assistance. Several persons were in close proximity to the unfortunate girls when they disappeared, but all seemed to have been impotent and unable to render succor. Later, William E. Heinken, Emmett L. Finks, and William Ketland set to work to recover the bodies, diving for them. After about an hour's work, Finks recovered the body of Miss Downey and Heinken that of Miss Kelly. An electric car bearing the remains reached the city at 8 o'clock last night while one of the electric storms which prevailed during the evening, was at its height. The remains were taken to the homes of the parents of the dead girls. Justice of the Peace, Kirby of Fairfax County, gave a certificate of death from the accidental drowning. A double funeral from St. Mary's Catholic Church on Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock has been arranged for the two young girls. Separate cortages will leave the houses of the parents and will meet at the church where joint services will be held. Another version of the sad affair is that the girls after taking hold of the boat, allowed themselves to be towed some distance from the shore when they finally let go. They found themselves in deep water and both sank immediately. The relatives and friends of the unfortunate girls have the sincere sympathy of the entire community. Miss Downey, anticipating a pleasure of a day at the dike, left here yesterday morning to be a guest of Miss Kelly during the day. When the news of the sad accident reached the city, it brought forth a genuine expression of regret. A special meeting of the Children of Mary will be held at St. Mary's Academy Tuesday evening at 7.30 to make arrangements to attend in a body the funeral of their two companions, Loretta Kelly and Leona Downey. That's about as sad as sad can be, man. Look here. You know I miss my, my social medias and whatnot. What do they got to say about all the stuff people doing around here? Always got to be in the know, don't you? A lot better than hearing about war starting and little girls drowning, huh? You would hope so. Let's see. Local brevities. The market will be closed Saturday, July 4th at 2 o'clock p.m. Attention is directed to the notice of the clerk of gas elsewhere in the Gazette. Persons desiring to avail themselves of a discount on gas bills have but two more days to do so. <coughs> Miss Annie V. Kitchener has been appointed the estate of her husband, the late George Kitchener. Lillian E. Conway, age 25, daughter of the late James H. Conway and Elizabeth Donaldson Conway died in Baltimore Saturday. On the account of last night's storm, the open air service, which were held in the Christ Churchyard, were held in the church building. Plans are being formulated for the organization of a mother's auxiliary of Boy Scouts, <coughs> Troop Number 2. All right, man, you ain't got to be such a smart aleck. All right, fine. In the case of Fred, Ray, Harry, Hampton, and Leslie Irwin, all of Washington, charged with shooting Maggie Jefferson, will be tried before the Corporation Court. Judge Louis C. Barlev presiding tomorrow. City tax collector P.F. Gorman announces that Wednesday will be the last day for the payment to city taxes in order to secure the discount of 5% allowed for the prompt payment of tax bills. Semiannual dividend, 3%, has been declared by the Board of Directors of Alexandria's National Bank, payable July 1st, 1914. Charles S.D. Adam has sold to Caleb B. Roberts' house and lot at 521 Queen Street. The schooner, Maud Bennett, loaded with building material by Henry K. Field Company, has sailed for the Lower River. Miss William Rathbone Smith and family will be leaving tomorrow for Cape Henry, where they will spend the balance of the summer. Cape Henry for the summer sounds like a good plan. I hope this damn shop gets us out of this time soon. Uh, you can hope, but it seems to me this place just loves taking us to the hottest spots it could find. It's the beginning of World War One. 
and most people have no idea how bad things will get. Will John and Ed stick around, or is it time for them to fall a bit further through time? Guess we'll have to wait and see. Join me in a few days when we look in on John and Ed again as they continue falling through the archives. This podcast has been brought to you by Watershed Z Productions. Starring Jim Hodges as the narrator, John Teach as John, Corey Andre as Ed, with special guest Mike Allender as advertisers. Music is from 1914 and in the public domain. In order, they are What Time Tomorrow by Billy Williams, Love's Sorrow by Emery B. Randolph, Credo by Rufo, and The High Cost of Living by the Peerless Quartet. Sound design and editing done by Hayden Hodges. The newspaper articles on this show are actual written accounts of the time period and can be found in the Library of Congress under Chronicling America. If you would like to help support the show, you can by sharing our show with your friends and family and checking us out on Patreon at The Falling Archivist, where you will find exclusive content and merchandise. Always pay attention to where and when you are, or you too may find yourself falling through the archives. Lunches and buy her milk punches. You try to keep up with the time.